The Creative Psychotherapist is the official podcast of the Creative Clinician's Corner, a practice building resource for creative psychotherapists. TCP Podcast is the cast for creative, expressive, and experiential focused psychotherapists curious to learn how to design, build, and scale a thriving private practice. Your host, Raina Lombardi, interviews successful therapists about the tools and strategies they have used to develop creative focused practices. They also talk about the products, services, and side hustles they have developed using their knowledge and creativity to enhance their therapy practices, make a greater impact in their communities, and diversify their income streams. Welcome. Now here's your host, Raina Lombardi. Okay, I want to uh, welcome uh, my guest, Brandy King Schaefer, today. Uh, she's a registered expressive arts therapist, a licensed mental health counselor, certified clinical mental health counselor, and a national certified counselor. Did you already get your LMHC? Yeah. So, why? Yeah. <laughs> That's so finally. exciting. So, finally. Oh my gosh. Right? Yeah. So, that's a lot of credentials. I just heard you say that. I'm like, is that me? Oh yeah, I did all that. That is. That's awesome. So um, I guess I'm I'm excited about it because I know that she's been waiting um, to hear back and it hadn't come in yet. So yes. um, yay. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and Brandy earned her master's degree in clinical mental health counseling with a certificate in filial play therapy from Stetson University. And she's currently working towards an additional credential as an ATR, um, BC, or a registered board certified art therapist uh, through additional education and internship hours. And she um, currently offers existential and person-centered expressive arts therapy at Expressionist Creative Counseling, LLC, located in Lake Mary, Florida. And she specializes in social anxiety, agoraphobia, perfectionism, and complicated grief. Um, Recently, she was a collaborative presenter at the 2019 AIDA conference, or the International Expressive Arts Therapy Association conference, where she facilitated image exploration and living multimodal sculptures for for the Cultivating Intentional Inclusivity Workshop. She's also presented original research on infusing creativity, existentialism, and trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy at the EBACA in Heidelberg, Germany, and the Bavarian International School. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was a while back. Um, that That was quite an experience. I really loved it. Very cool. So yeah. what does EBACA stand for, for those of us that don't know? Um, it's the European Bound American Counseling Association. I think I just stumbled over that. But <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> so, cool. Yeah, it's, a, it's another international type of conference where uh, counselors can go and learn from one another. Um, I, my school asked me because I had a specialty in existentialism. And Germany just seemed like the right place for me to go at the time. I was finishing, um, I was finishing my master's degree, and it was just a really great opportunity to go there and uh, speak about existentialism and trauma-focused uh, CBT. And the work that I was doing to put those two things together with uh, play therapy at the time. Oh, cool. But yeah, it, it, it was, it was a, a wonderful experience. That sounds was, awesome. Yeah, I was lucky to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really cool. So now um, you have had expressionist creative counseling for how long has that been in existence now? It's been a little over two years. Um, yeah, I think maybe two years, four months, something like that. Uh, yeah, I've heard that businesses, it takes like five years to get going. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've been lucky, like, like I'm still in business. <laughs> 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 So, you know, and it's always a struggle, like when you first start to get clients. Um, Yeah. But it's, uh, it's still going. I'm really happy about that. That's wonderful. It is challenging when we first start to get clients. We focus so much on learning how to be a good therapist and clinician when we're in school that, um, 
you know, if you decide to go into private practice, you're pretty much having to do the research and figure out how to do that on your own. It's not really a topic that's covered in most graduate training programs. Exactly. Yeah. I see some people, I read a lot of articles on LinkedIn. Um, I don't really go on Facebook that much, but uh, I just read about other therapists who've gone this route. And it seems like there's a couple of therapists out there who've done like a business marketing degree concurrent mm-hmm. with their, um, with their therapy degree. And that works out really well for them uh, yeah. because they know, they know how to get out of school and how to jump right in and Absolutely. reach out to the public. Like, I don't think if I hadn't had you as a supervisor, I wouldn't have known like half of the things that I knew to do. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> you always encouraged me to reach out to the community and, uh, just giving me ideas about like writing more things like that. I think yeah. that if I had if I hadn't known you, I would have been really a, a slow process to get the business Aww. going. Well, yeah. thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> 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 Knowing the right people, I guess, helps. Right. Well, I think that you know you bring up an important part of this process, which is reaching out for others to help. Yeah. You know, other people that are doing it too that have kind of figured it out as well. And, and why should you make the same mistakes if you don't have to? Oh my goodness. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I don't have to reinvent the wheel each time someone starts a private practice. Right. Right. There should be some ways of helping um, get it going without suffering too badly. I mean, sometimes I think the first couple of months, there's a lot of suffering because there's anxiety and different emotions that go into it. You're, you've put your heart into developing something and you want to see it grow and blossom. And there's this, you know, insecurity about what's happening and whether it's going to thrive or not. Right. Or if you're going to close up shop. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Um, and there's something you had said a long time ago about how it's a collaborative um, community instead of looking at it as a competition with other therapists, mm-hmm. because truly I could never handle more than 20 people a week. And how many people are in my community? It must be, you know, we're talking about Orlando area. So there's <laughs> lots of people here. There's, it's, it's not like I'm competing with other therapists. It's actually their resources for areas where I don't have the specialty. Right, right. I think it, look at it as it's we're all a big team together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah, I think that's a really important piece um, that sometimes is a miss because there's a sense of um, well, it comes from that fear place, right? Of I want my business to be successful. I I need my business to be successful so that I can sustain myself financially. So there's the want and the need. Um, and, and so if we get caught up in that place of fear of, I'm not going to be able to do it if somebody, you know, takes a client from me, or if I'm Mm -hmm. not willing to refer clients to other people, um, we get, it, it creates a funk and, it's not healthy. Um, Right. And it it takes away from, I think your ethical, your ethical standards. Anyway, you're, you're in here to help the client the best possible way. And mm -hmm. if I'm hoarding people, that's not helping. (laughs) That's not helping them. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) We can share. It's just like with friends, you can share your friends. That's That's fine. And um, the more resources that I have, the other therapists that I know, it actually is better for the client. Everyone who comes to see me, Like I said before, like, I feel like when a client comes to see me, not only do I have you, my mentor, uh, my other supervisor, Kathleen Horn, like I picture you all behind me. So when the client comes in, I feel like they're seeing five people. It's not just me. Like we're all in it together. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And I I think that also helps if you have other therapists in the area where you're like, oh, okay, they're talking to me right now, but I know that they might actually work with my, you know, this other therapist I know better. I need to let them know about her. Right. Right. Or like, hey, I can't do what they need me to do in an hour a week. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes it's like that. It's knowing your own limitations. And um, I think that's the, that's the best thing, knowing what you're good at and knowing where, 
you, you can't go there with the client at that certain area. So find someone else in the community who can. This episode of the Creative Psychotherapist Podcast is sponsored by Florida Art Therapy Services. Are you at a point in your career where you are ready to become a supervisor? Are you interested in learning how to go deep using mandala art in your work with clients? We are a Florida Chapter 491 Board Certified Continuing Ed Provider offering the 12-hour Qualified Supervisor Training for LMHCs, LCSWs, and LMFTs on February 28th and 29th, 2020, as well as June 25th and 26th, 2020. We are also hosting art therapist Carol Cox and Amy Bucciarelli to teach their 20-hour Mastering the Meaning of Mandala's course, April 17th through the 19th, 2020. This course is amazing. It will change the lens you use to view artwork in a truly meaningful way. To learn more or sign up to any of our courses, head to www.floridaarttherapyservices.com. What's really great is other therapists might be providing really creative resources that you may not be able to provide, but might be beneficial for your client, right? Like there's another practice locally, they're doing um, like meditation classes, like weekly meditation classes, um, which I think is wonderful. That's not something that I feel that I could offer here. So um, I'm happy to like have that material to market that opportunity to clients out in my waiting room, even though it's for another practice, um, because it could be a benefit to their healing journey, even though I'm not the person facilitating that or providing that, at least I can link them with that resource should they want it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think that, you know, we're not the they're the expert in their life, right? We're just here to help them along their path. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, if someone wants to just see me individually, but then wants to bring in their husband, I might refer out then to a couples counselor because I know that's not my strong suit. Mm -hmm. So like I do really well individually. So I need to make sure if someone wants to do couple counseling, I refer them out. That's just one example, just to make sure they're getting the best help possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) So in thinking about um, your transition from grad school into private practice, what made you decide to say, you know what, I'm just going to go straight out and straight into it myself. This is what I want to do. And you went for it. Yeah. So when I was doing my practicum and internship in um, under Stetson, um, I was working at um, not only crisis stabilization unit, but also uh, like as a crisis counselor once they got out of the CSU. And I met some wonderful people and I actually, uh, I, the relationship was only, you could only have eight sessions. So it was very limited. Um, and I would have mm-hmm. clients who would start, we'd start to build a really strong therapeutic relationship and then their eight sessions were up and then they would have to have a waiting period of a few months. And then they weren't allowed to come back and ask for me specifically. So that was, I thought that wasn't, uh, I thought, I didn't think that was for the best benefit of the client because they spent, especially some people would spend a lot of time finally opening up and finally trusting someone. Yeah. And when I had to tell them, Hey, this is our sixth or seventh session. We're only going to have one or two more left. You can just see their face fall. Like I'm just starting to explore this area. Mm Mm-hmm. And so for me, I knew I didn't want to work, oh, and also with an agency, so I didn't want to work with those limitations for one, but also with an agency, um, I, they would give you eight clients a day. It was, you know, up to eight clients a day, and I would be worn out by the end of the day. And I like to really go deep with clients, and like, if there's a certain movie or a book that they really like, I want to look that up, read it, watch the movie, listen to the song. So I understand where they're coming from with this specific, um, this, this thing that's really important to them. And mm-hmm. I can't do that if I'm seeing eight clients a day, five days a week. <laughs> that's just not going to leave time for me to have a life <laughs> no. or time for me to process what they've told me and what they've shared. Like I, I can't mm-hmm. process, you know, what's that 40 hours, you know, of 
of client FaceTime plus the research you do before and after you see a client. There's a lot that goes into that. It's not just the hour with the client. It's researching what they, you know, there's their particular issue. Mm-hmm. And um, like I said, looking up what's important to them, especially creative things that are important to them. Like there oh, might be sure. poetry or something. I want to read that and then think about the client while I'm reading it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think when they, when they bring in those materials and they talk to you about a particular movie or book or what, what have you, they're, they're saying, hey, here's some insight into me. If you take yes. the time to um, go out and consume it, then you can utilize that in, in part of the therapeutic work as um, some common language to use as a metaphor for their experience, which, and the work in, I think, as creative therapists, we're always looking to deepen the metaphor and go further into the metaphor. Absolutely. In fact, I think it, I see it a lot of times as like a legend to a map of their mind. And they're mm-hmm. telling me, this is who I am. Here's the legend to me. Mm-hmm. And Here's, you know, if you understand these symbols, then you can understand me better. And that's really what I want to do. I had a client ask me one time, like, because we were talking about intimacy and like, what's intimacy? Like, well, that is, put on the spot, right? Everyone reads about it. You know, you think about it all the time, but what is it really? Mm -hmm. You are modeling it for the client in session. But really it's, um, it's the... It's to know someone and to be known completely with non-judgment and just total acceptance. Mm-hmm. And when they're giving you that legend to their mind, that, that map, they're saying, hey, um, this is me, all, my, all the things I think about, do you accept it? And yeah. then once they have that experience with you, they can take it out to the world mm-hmm. and they can model it for other people. I, you're not just treating the client, you're treating everyone in their life too, in a way. I didn't mean to go so big. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, given that you have, um, you know, some focus in existentialism. Right. <laughs> I, go, I go pretty deep. <laughs> it makes sense to go in it. that direction, right? But I, but I, think, yeah. I think that what you say is true. You know, we are all interconnected and we do um, affect one another. And our impact on somebody, an individual, that might lead them to cause impact to another individual. The energy that we exchange um, between human beings gets passed around. um, Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Because if someone can tell me like their darkest secret and I can look at them and be like, you know what, that's okay. And then they can go home and then maybe they're a parent and their kid tells them something that they're like, I never would have thought that, but they're like, you know what? That's okay. And then that kid feels accepted. So it's, it does pass it on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And when it's not accepted, then we start to facilitate a game of what I call feelings ping pong. Oh, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Like I often talk about it with kids that I work with, you know, they're giving their mad and sad feelings away. And so if they're acting mad and sad and they do something to cause hurt to somebody else, then that person feels hurt. What do they do? Well, they try to give those feelings back and now you're in a game of feelings ping pong. Absolutely. Only nobody wins. No, nobody wins with that. And everyone just throws their paddle down and leaves the game. Yes. <laughs> and then I don't want to connect with anyone else. Like I'm done with people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the work that we do really um, does make an impact. And yeah. so I think focusing on delivering services in the private practice allows you to make a, um, at least from what I'm hearing you say, is a more meaningful impact because of the length of time that you get to see clients for, the depth that you get to go with clients, which might not be possible in the uh, more um, agency-like setting, and then how you structure how you see your clients and the time that you see your clients. Can you share a little bit about that? Because I think that um, 
just in knowing you, I know you're very intentional about how you structure your time and your schedule when you're seeing clients. Can you talk a little bit about that, Brandy? Yeah. Um, well, I, I learned, I don't know if it was from you or Kathleen, but one of you had said something about, you know, making choices available, inviting the client in. Um, so not only do I have, like, I'll, it depends, like, I know kind of where we've been talking about, like what we, me and the client have been discussing and where they are. And from that information, I'll, I'll have some choices available for them. Like say there, maybe I know that there's something they need to flush out. So I'll have some clay available so they can actually sculpt out the thing and we can look at it, talk about it. Um, I'll have that on like one part of the table and I'll also have maybe watercolors if they're, they're just trying to, they're, they're feeling if everything's they're just kind of sliding around, something that they're thinking about. I'll, I'll have different type of mediums out on the table for them. Mm-hmm. Um, but okay. So not only that, that's just like a regular hour session. I also have, uh, what I call individual intensives where someone can come in and book me for like three hours and we can go really mm-hmm. deep. And with that, I've, I kind of have a structure of not only do we like, we just, if they're a brand new client, we do like the DDS just so I know where they're at, where they're starting mm-hmm. from. And then I'll do, uh, we'll take a break. Um, we'll dialogue with the image. They'll write, uh, they'll write to the image as well. And then they'll read out loud what they wrote to me. And that takes them in, you know, deep into the process. And then from there, maybe we'll do a guided imagery um, where I do, a, it's sort of like, um, I'll read a story to them. And they're, but they're talking to me as they're imagining the story. So I kind of know what the images are that are coming up for them. And then I have out um, from Deborah, I, Chopin, I can't, I never can say her name right, mm-hmm. but she's so wonderful. So the touch drawing, so I have all the touch drawing materials available. And then after they do the guided imagery, they'll work through the touch drawing to kind of um, create that image of what they saw in the story. Um, and, and from there, we'll title each image and we'll talk about it. Um, and, and then we'll take another break and then there will be, what's, what do we usually do after that? Um, I mean, it really depends. It depends on where they've gone with the touch drawing. We'll definitely do maybe some more writing mm-hmm. and, um, and maybe just some more, more drawing. It just it really depends on like where, what happens after the touch drawing for them. Mm-hmm. Um, but it de- definitely takes three hours. Yeah. So uh, you're really working heavily with like the intermodal transfer um, work. Yeah. And again, that that's part of that going deeper into the metaphor and and understanding the metaphor through the different creative processes. And then you also referenced the DDS. And so for those that don't know what the DDS is, it's the Diagnostic Drawing Series, which is a, an art therapy um, clinical uh, assessment, um, which can really help kind of identify um, where the client is and what mental health struggles they might be experiencing. Right. Um, um, it, and it depends on if the client is open to movement. Like I, I love it when they are, you know, cause then sometimes we can make a gesture or something that kind of came up when they were doing the touch drawing or when they were doing the, uh, the imagery, what, what came up for you in your body? Where did you feel it? Mm-hmm. Show me what the feeling is with the movement. And do you want to make a sound that goes along with it? You know, and sometimes that releases something where, it's really hard to explain, but it breaks past the defenses of, you know, of of them having to worry about what they're showing you. Mm -hmm. It it really taps into a very internal place where all of a sudden it's okay just to show you. Mm -hmm. And it goes, it it really moves the relationship from that point. And then they're your client for sure. Like they're coming (laughs) back, like, like, Randy's okay with whatever I'm going to do in here. So let's just, I'll come back. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So you have some clients that you see individually for an hour and then some that are more intensive. Um, And, you know, I was asking about the scheduling piece too, of how do you structure that? If you're doing an intensive, is that the only case, the only client that you'll see on that given day? Or would you have an intensive and then have an individual after that or before that? Yeah, no way. There's no way I would do another one after that. I'm an introvert, you know, so I need my energy. 
and it takes a lot of energy to be completely present with the person for three hours and mm-hmm. to give them give them what they deserve like the the time and the the attention and the intention that they deserve so to have someone come after someone before I think would be stealing away from them so mm-hmm. I want to make sure that I'm completely present for them in those three hours and then I have to write about it after they leave. And then I usually like draw an image after they leave too, of how I felt, um, what I, mm. what I noticed. Um, yeah. And then maybe I'll dance, you know, and I'll get it out for me. So that way I can go home and have my own life, you know? I love that. I love that you shared that part of the process. Oftentimes in an agency setting where we are on the go intense boom, 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 boom. Like you don't have enough time. You don't have enough time to finish your case notes or your group notes and um, calls and all that stuff. By the time you leave, you haven't had any time to really process your experience of the work that that you um, did and shared with the client and yeah. the energy that you took on during that time frame, right? Absolutely, because I'm there too. You know, <laughs> you are there for the client but you are a person and you're there too. Mm -hmm. And so that I'm not taking those feelings home with me. I get them out in the room and then I can, you know, close the file. It's that one's done, you know, Mm -hmm. I'll see them next week. (laughs) Yeah. I think it's important to process um, as a therapist, what came up for you too, you know, just Mm -hmm. because, you know, counter-transference is real. You want to make sure that um, you're getting out any feelings that came up for yourself as well. I, I agree. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. So you're very intentional about how you structure your time, um, which I, I think is a a beautiful thing. If you can do that, I, I, that's a work in progress for me of, of structuring my time so that I have um, more intentional breaks. I definitely do a midday break and give myself time for lunch. That's really an essential ingredient for me. If I don't eat, then I'm no good to nobody because I can't focus. I get a headache. My blood sugar gets all wacky. It's just no, it's not good. That's not fun. Mm-mm, no. So I know like that time is really essential, but there are some days where I'll see, um, you know, client appointments back to back for five hours or six hours. And then I do need some time after to just kind of, and just breathe out and right. purge out what I processed in that six hour period. Right. Cause it is an intense amount of time to be containing um, for other people. Right. To be that safe container. It mm-hmm. does take a lot of energy. And your practice is more mature than mine. Mine's very new, right? So mm-hmm. I don't, I don't have eight clients booked for a day. I would never. I don't know that I would do that anyway. But I don't even have that um, that many clients yet, right? So mm-hmm. maybe it's easier for me to say, oh, I would only do one for that. <laughs> I would only do one intensive a day. Maybe it's easier for me to say that because I don't have six people trying to get in in that same day. <laughs> yeah, I definitely early on in my practice, I I had a lot more flexibility um, in that I could schedule people on different days, and so I would just see clients for a couple of hours a day each day of the week, and that was really nice. And having yeah. the ability to do art in between um, right. or after, like I I really enjoyed that. And I had I had a practice where um, I would see clients pretty intensely. And then on Friday was a light day. And like on Friday afternoon would be my art making afternoon. And I would make art that afternoon. But once my practice started growing and getting a little bit busier, um, that kind of shifted and changed. But um, I certainly still think about those things of like what's working in the practice now and what are some things that worked in the past that helped me and how can I um, shift and change? Like, okay, I really appreciated carving out that time for myself. And I think I should go back to adding some of that time. So how can I readjust the schedule to accommodate it? Absolutely. Also, since you're driving sometimes to do groups, mm-hmm. you're missing out on that. That's, that's work time too, even though you're in the car. Right. Yeah, yeah it's, I, th- it's, I think it is important to find that time for yourself. Um, 
just like you're saying, you get tired and hungry, and then the client who comes in while you're still hungry, ooh, I feel bad for that guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Not good. He's going to be confronted that day. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's funny. <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit about how you've been using Meetup okay. to help market your practice. But I think first we should just kind of explain what Meetup is for folks that don't know, because I think there's a lot of people that aren't familiar with it. Um, would you mind talking about oh, that? Absolutely. I'm not, I, I swear you guys, this is not a commercial for Meetup. This is just, it's something <laughs> I found. And I like them. <laughs> I'm not getting paid by them in any way. Um, it's just something I found where I wanted to reach the community. Um, I didn't have a huge budget for marketing. So that's number one, because you're starting off as a private practice. You know, you, you get on psychology today, it, it, you know, and then you get on maybe good therapy, maybe being seen and all these um, places for therapists to be, you know, to be marketed, it costs money. So yeah, it does. It's, a, it's, a lot, it's a lot of money and it, you're already starting your business and it's difficult. That adds up quick. Oh my God. It adds up really quick. And plus you're trying to pay rent, all this other stuff. So um, meetup was really low cost. I think it was actually like sixty-five dollars uh, for six months, so oh, that that's is not bad. Not bad mm -hmm. at all. So it ends up being like one hundred thirty-two dollars a year. Um, that's just for the basic. Uh, that's just for the basic membership, and it lets you reach out to the community and say, "Hey, I, I'm interested in doing groups. Um, this is the group that I would like to do." Um, you just kind of tell them a little bit about your your practice. Uh, you know, you're. I think you're allowed to make up to three groups with it for that basic membership um, and the groups can have 49 members each because you're counted as a member for each group so if you do the math on that you can have you can reach 147 people you can have 147 people at any time in your three groups and that comes down to a dollar and 12 per person that you're paying for, for a whole year that's really not bad. That's an awesome return on your yeah. investment. I mean, it certainly beats what you would pay to get in front of that many people using AdWords, Google oh AdWords. Gosh, yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Oh my God. I just can't. Yeah, definitely. And then you, you can really, you have to use, you can only use, um, you know, their platform. So you each, you, you have a, mem a membership site for each group that you do. Um, and it's a little limited. I mean, you can add some images, which is great. So if you have pictures of your space, um, I never take pictures of clients or their images. Uh, so I only take photos of my mm -hmm. own images or, you know, if my niece does something, I'll take a photo of that, right? If she says sure. yes. Um, and I can use those on the site um, just to kind of give people an idea of what's going to happen when they show up. What's this place going to look like? Because I'm especially interested in people with social anxiety. Um, and agoraphobia. So if somebody's like, I'm just, they're scared to leave their home. Mm -hmm. I like to have like a video, which is on my website. So uh, I can link to the, my website on meetup and then have mm. pictures of the space too. But like the video is like to show them, Hey, this is the parking lot. This is how you're going to get to my space. This is what it's going to look like when you get here, just so they have an idea. So they feel comfortable when it actually happens. Mm -hmm. um, but on meetup, you can say, Hey, look, these are the stairs. This is the waiting room. This is the space. Um, you know, let, let, you know, kind of line out for them exactly what it's going to be, what the whole process is. So they know what to expect. Because mm -hmm. if you already have social anxiety, you're nervous about even walking in the room. So yeah. it's kind of good to know, okay, I've seen her face before. I've seen that chair. I'm just going to sit in that chair I saw online. So they, mm -hmm. they have it kind of like, okay, just get him in the, I'm in the door. It's okay. I, I've seen this before. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, um, a great way of addressing a barrier, right? You recognize that one of the barriers for the client in coming in is coming in and oh, yeah. the first time. So how can we rehearse that um, yeah. and give them the tool to rehearse that before they actually do it, um, yes. which is wonderful. So I think that's a great tip um, for anybody because regardless of, whether the person is struggling with anxiety or social anxiety or if it's depression or any yeah. other issue, um, it's intimidating to come and reach out and go someplace for help and 
know that like, okay, I'm going to go here and now I'm going to have to open myself up and be very vulnerable with somebody I don't know in a place I've never been before. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I think that it, you can write posts on Meetup as well. And I, I would say to try to write those the way that you speak, because people mm. can tell if it's some kind of like phony copy. You know, if somebody copies and pastes an article, they can tell, you know, you don't sound like a real person. So I would say write the way that you talk. And um, mm. that way they're already familiar with your vernacular and the way that you're going to express yourself. So when they meet you for the first time, it's like they've, they've already met you. Mm. Beautiful. They already, yeah, they know who you are. I love um, that. Yeah, anything to make the person feel comfortable. Because like you said, it is a vulnerable position um, to have to go in and see a therapist and say, hey, I'm having this issue. Mm -hmm. And they don't know you. I, I'm always amazed at the courage of somebody just to walk in the door and just start talking to me. Because mm -hmm. they don't, they've never met me before. And I think that's so wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my God, you did that today. I make sure I tell them at the end of the first session, like, wow, you actually came in today and you did this. And I'm like, thank you for trusting me. That's a big mm -hmm. gift. Yeah. It is. It is. And so um, when you're hosting the groups on Meetup, oh, yeah. is, they have lots and lots of different um, options, different groups and activities uh, for the community. When you're the host, um, do you monitor what other people are talking about? Are there any rules or anything that you have to set up in the group and the online sphere? Yeah. So I would say I look out for, I don't know if I set up rules. I, I do say, I do say that this is a respectful place. And um, I do tell them ahead of time that when they come in that all the images that other people make, we're not going to judge those. And you can say that I, when I look at your image, I feel this way, but we're not mm -hmm. saying your image is this. We're not interpreting for the people mm -hmm. because they're just, that would be just pre projecting their own thoughts onto somebody else's uh, image. Mm -hmm. But for the actual monitoring of the space, I don't let anyone, I like, I will delete a comment of someone selling things to people. Uh -huh. Cause that has happened where like someone joins the depression. I have a depression group an anxiety group and one called like sunrise creations. It's just really mm -hmm. generic. Hey, we're going to create, you know, in the morning. Sounds cool. Um, but if someone's trying to sell something to people who are depressed or anxious, I will delete that right away. Mm. They'll still say, yeah, they'll be trying to, I don't know, sell a service or sell a product. And, and that's not what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What I love about Meetup is that you can you can set the price for whatever Meetup, but however much you want it to be. Um, so, but I try to make it affordable. So, if someone can't afford individual therapy, I want them to be able to come in for group therapy. So, mm -hmm. I set it at a really reasonable price. Um, I think it's a reasonable price. Um, yeah. And so, with meetup, does it limit the amount of um, times that you're able to meet or do you set that schedule and it, that, that's not part of the fees? Yeah, that's not part of the fees. So their only uh, limit is that you can have three groups and that basic, okay. that basic membership. Now I haven't done meetup pro. It's something I'm going to look at for my budget for next year where you can have as many groups as you want. Oh. So what happens to me now though, is that so I, I have like regularly scheduled uh, like days, you know, meets that we're due, like an anxiety day, a depression day, uh, sunrise creations day. And there's some weeks that nobody shows up. That's okay. Um, I would say to anyone who's starting out to, to make sure that you get a confirmation of attendees mm -hmm. and through meetup, they can actually pay online through meetup and not through you. Okay. So that way they can put their credit card information in that way. You're not even involved in that meetup. Meetup sends the money to you and it, like automatically through your bank account. So you don't even have to touch their money. Um, when I first started out, I was saying, Hey, you can either use meetup pay or bring in cash or a check. Right. Um, but then I didn't know who was going to show up. <laughs> like the first one I did, I, I got really nervous. I'm like, okay, I put this out there. What if, what if all 10 people show up? <laughs> Am I ready for that? So, so um, you know, I was running all around making sure it was okay, and then only two people showed up. It's just okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I wish I would have known ahead of time. Like I, I should have just mm-hmm. done straight through meetup. That way it takes the pressure off of me. Like of, yeah. it makes knowing what to expect. You know, but that's just a, that's part of the learning process of trying new things out um, in your business yeah. is you learn what works and what needs refinement and, you yeah. know, how to, how to make, create systems that help you run uh, more proficiently and yeah. efficiently. Um, yeah. And you can have as many people show up to your group as you want. I didn't want more than 10 people. Mm-hmm. For me, that's as much as I can handle in a group. Sure. That's so, where I'm at now anyway. Who, who knows when I grow? I don't know. But only 10 people, I, can, I can't see me uh, working with more than that. Um, that's a good size group, I feel like, though, for, oh, one, yeah. for one group leader. Yeah. Um, I had a group this morning that was close to 20 people. Um, yeah. And that's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I think at this point, I mean, I feel like I'm far enough in my career that I can manage and do okay. But if I were early on, oh, that, that would throw me for a loop. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It's a lot. Because you, you have to check in with everyone and mm-hmm. especially if they're doing images, like how are they doing? And you miss a lot, yeah. right? If the, the oh. more people, you can't really attend to every, to, you can't see everything or hear everything that's happening. Right. Um, so I feel like t- 10 is good. This is like a group that I provide to another agency. So I never know how many people are going to show up until I get there. Oh my God. Um, yeah. That would so. be nerve wracking for me. <laughs> I don't know that I can handle that. Yeah. Especially like I, I'm really um, attuned to like people who are severe, like are really heavy introverts. So a lot of things happening inside of them and like mm-hmm. maybe their face doesn't give off much, but since I'm such an introvert, I can kind of tell when something's mm-hmm. happening to somebody and I like to be able to go over to them and see how they're doing. Right. Or even yeah. say, I've noticed this. Can mm-hmm. you tell me? what's happening. Definitely. I think with, uh, you know, I actually, with that, I would really like to do like, I think maybe five is my ideal group. That way I can be in the midst of everything, you know? Yeah. No, that, yeah. Five or six people is a really great size. Yeah. And, um, 10, 10 to 12 is kind of like the max that I prefer. I really don't like going over 12, but sometimes, that just happens. Um, yeah. So with Meetup, even though you've been really kind of using it to push group work, has it been helpful in gaining individuals? Absolutely. Into your practice. Okay. Yeah, and that's something I wasn't expecting. So I was. I really went to Meetup because I thought I need to work on facilitating groups, and. What's happened is someone will come to one group and then they'll come in for individual therapy afterwards. And that's where things get really good. (laughs) That's like, that's where we really dig in. But it's nice, especially if someone is like a fireman or policeman and they've never thought about going to therapy before. And they're like, well, I'm just going on meetup for something fun. And they might see sunrise creations. So all right, maybe I'll go create something tomorrow morning. And then, um, then they end up really liking it. Mm-hmm. And they'll come in and say, wow, I would have never done this on my own. I would have never just mm-hmm. gone into therapy. But I thought since this, these other guys were going, maybe I would go too. And now I want to go by myself. So mm-hmm. it's a way of dipping their toe into it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's, I, especially like male clients in particular, because I don't think that I, I haven't, it seems like there's it, it, female clients are more drawn to the art therapy, the expressive arts therapy. Mm-hmm. And for a male client, I, I love that they go in with a group of guys and then they're like, actually, I really like this. I want to do this. Mm-hmm. And they'll come in by themselves. And that's a really good relationship after that. That's cool. Yeah. So when you're, when you're listing it up on there for the, um, uh, on the listing and meetup, you're not really promoting it as therapy. You're just promoting it as an art group for depression or an art group for anxiety yeah. or just yeah. an art group for self-care, right? Right. So it'll be like, maybe I'll say support group, like anxiety support group. 
-hmm. because we all have anxiety in this group. You're going to be around other people who have it and know what you're talking about. Um, Oh, we've all dealt with depression in this group, you know? So it, those are the two ones that I have so far, other than just the generic Mm -hmm. creations one. Um, But yeah, so it's not, it's not really therapy group, like a group therapy, but it's, um, it's more like an invitation to the expressive arts with other people who had the same struggles that you have. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're kind of like introducing them to the process yeah, and saying, okay, we're not going to go in depth into, to therapy topics, but we're going to introduce you to the process in order to kind of dip your toes in there and then see if it might be the right fit for you to actually do the therapeutic work. See if you want to go swimming. <laughs> First nice. you just, just dip your toe, dip your toe, and if you want to go swimming, let's meet you and me. Let's, let's meet jump in. in. Let's jump in. <laughs> <laughs> jump in the deep end. <laughs> <laughs> right. I live there. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's a it's a gentle way to introduce people, especially I haven't met a lot of people who know what the expressive arts is. So mm-hmm. it's kind of nice to say hey, this is what the expressive arts is. And there's something about it that it really touches people. So even mm-hmm. just those little um, group meetings that we have, something will touch within them and they'll say, wow, I felt something. I want to check this out. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it, I think it's a gentle way to introduce people to the expressive arts. I, I think too, you're, again, when you think about breaking down barriers, you're breaking down another barrier um, because somebody might be willing to go seek support and to do art about something, but they might not necessarily want to go to therapy. Um, right, right. And so you, you're like, hey, we're, this is, you know, we're, we're just... Oh. Like, like-minded folks doing some art, let's chill out. <laughs> yeah, they get through the stigma because it's just people. We're all just folks here mm-hmm. and we're all just painting out our feelings a little bit. That's no big deal. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's wonderful. Um, and I think that's a really uh, creative You've put your own creative spin on how to reach people. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't heard of any other one, any other therapist using Meetup as a tool um, to get clients in the door. I have encouraged my clients to use Meetup as a way yeah. to connect and and find out about different things being offered in the community. Um, but I think you're really using it in a unique way. Thank you, Rena. You're welcome. You're welcome. Are there any resources that you think would be beneficial for listeners that are just starting out and want to jump into the deep end, if you will, and getting their private practice going? Oh, well, I think the number one thing I would say is make sure that you have the right supervisors. I think mm. that I had, luckily I had, I found you um, and you have the background in art therapy and you, you are, you teach supervision. So I'm like, she's going to be good. Right. And <laughs> she's going to be a great supervisor. And then uh, Kathleen Horn at the Expressive Arts Institute in Sarasota, who is also my teacher, mm-hmm. uh, became my uh, supervisor as well. So I had dual supervision. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's so important to have supervisors that you really trust and uh, that speak your same language. Mm -hmm. Um, If I didn't feel comfortable with you, I think it would have been a much harder process starting all of this, Mm -hmm. but that you were so encouraging. Uh, So I I guess I'm really saying the support, make sure you have the right support and, and that you're totally honest with your supervisors and say, Hey, guess what? I'm not so good at this part. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's been times just to be completely vulnerable and just say, hey, this happened. What do you think? And it's such a great relief to be able to say that. So having people you trust, number one. Um, make sure you're doing everything legally correct. <laughs> That's really important. That's like, a big one. <laughs> ethics, ethics, maybe ethics. Okay, number one, ethics. So um, I do everything in an ethical light. So what was really tough was to find an office space um, as a registered intern 
but there's also a licensed therapist there. Mm-hmm. So it was a real struggle um, renting. <laughs> like first I started off just renting a room for a few hours, like, you know, mm-hmm. and then I went to a group practice where I shared an office with someone and now I'm finally in an office. It's my own office and there's other licensed therapists in the building, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was the real struggle is finding a place where you uh, have other therapists around and mm-hmm. a place where you're comfortable. Oh my God, that was huge. Yeah. I won't get into that, but it was that, really- that could be a t- an entire another episode, <laughs> which we should another do. Episode. Okay. <laughs> I'll put that on hold. Okay. Make um, sure you do it right. Legal Zoom is what I use to get my business started. Mm. Uh, again, I'm not using that as a commercial, but um, they were really great. Just uh, making sure that everything that I needed to have an order for a bit, have an, um, I'm legally covered for my business through Legal Zoom. Awesome. And they ask, they, they also provide like legal counsel as well. Um, just so you're, you're okay, right? Yeah. <laughs> you do that that's the right? important part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And make sure you have your malpractice insurance. And um, that's, those are the basics, I think. Mm-hmm. And a budget. Make sure you have a budget. That helps. <laughs> yeah, that helps because yeah. the practice can eat up your savings really quick. Oh my God. you edit. Mm-hmm. Yes. So if I did, I have also a, a job on the side. So if I didn't have that, I'd be in real trouble sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. when clients aren't coming in. And that actually helped alleviate some of the stress. If somebody needed to cancel, I'm like, okay, I can still pay rent. It's going to be fine. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I can still pay my bills. Um, but yeah. So budgeting is, is very important too. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, if people wanted to reach out and learn more about you and your practice or connect with you, where can they find you? I am at expressionistcounseling.com and also on Instagram. I usually try to post a, an image daily or at least once a week um, on Instagram. I think it's just expressionist counseling on Instagram. I'm on Facebook, but not very much. Um, <laughs> you can find me there. I have a Snapchat too, just for younger people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So some of the teenagers come in and say, where's your snaps? So I started making snaps as well. And that's just expressionist counseling on Snapchat. That's cool. I don't even know how to use that. Oh, we got to show you <laughs> that one. <That's, laughs> you got the filters. Everything's funny. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Brandy, for talking with me today. And I hope the listeners find some value in hearing about how they could use Meetup to um, help drive traffic um, and break down barriers to getting clients to come in for services. So thank you. Thank you, Raina. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Creative Psychotherapist. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For show notes, downloads, and additional resources, head over to the website at www.creativeclinicianscorner.com.